for tapes, CDs, DVDs, to our publication, Voices from His Excellent Glory, Declaring the Kingdom, write P.O. Box 21516, Hot Springs, Arkansas, Zip 71903. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com. There are many free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Friday morning, December the 29th, 1978. Midwinter camp meeting being held at Lake Hamilton Bible Camp, Hot Springs, Arkansas. Wynn Worley is a speaker on this tape. Praise the Lord. This morning I'd like for us to think about transferring spirits. It is possible for spirits to transfer, and many spirits are picked up this way. If our eyes were to be opened and we were to see the spirit world as it really is, I think it'd scare the daylights out of us. That's probably why God in mercy has not done this. Because the unprotected mind peering into the spirit world can come unjointed by the experience. If you think this is far-fetched, this is exactly what happens to the alcoholic in DTs when he begins to see all kinds of weird things. He actually sees those. Those are not figments of his imagination. He's looking into the spirit world with an unprotected mind. And it's enough to drive you insane. The LSD, the person who drops LSD does the same thing. And other drugs, especially the hallucinogenics, are very good at dropping the guard that God has built into us to keep us from seeing into the spirit world. Now, the mind under the blood is able to see into the spirit world without it unhinging them. But even here, we have to be careful because we can get caught up with the idea of seeing spirits and the next thing you know, we get fascinated by it and we drop our caution and our protection and the next thing you know, you can be spun out of shape. I have been in places where, uh, I remember one meeting in particular, we were in, uh, well, north of us, and I won't mention the place because some of you might know it, but uh, the people were deliverance-oriented people and we were having some very heavy and successful deliverances. But then I noticed these people were taken up so with visions until every time we went into deliverance, they, they, one or two of them would see a vision. Well, I see this, I see that. And then everybody would try to get an understanding what the vision was. The demon was manifesting. And I said, hey, look, cut out the vision mess. Let's get that demon. He's manifesting. Let's get him. And I go ahead and throw the demon out while they were trying to figure out what the vision meant. I mean, who cares what the vision... I think it was a distraction. I think they had become so wrapped up in this. Now, visions are a valid revelation technique by the Lord. But don't you become dependent on those. And visions from the Lord, by the way, are clear, sharp, and they don't bring fear, and they don't bring cloudiness nor confusion. That's the mark of the enemy moving in. And while we should look for these things and welcome them when they come, I mean, what a blessing it is that Adam A was given the vision on schizophrenia. Aren't you glad? Well, we have used this over and over again. Uh, we've been so thankful uh, for the fact that God revealed these things. And he does reveal this way. We mustn't throw it out. But on the other hand, we must recognize, as I pointed out, when you go into fasting, everything that you see and everything that you hear and everything that you perceive in your spirit is not of the Lord. The spirit world, when you go into fasting, I'll mention it for the sake of those who weren't here, when you go into fasting, you open up to the spirit world. But there are two sides to that world. Be sure that you're maintaining a balance in the Scriptures and a balance in praise and prayer to the Lord Jesus Christ so that you can understand what's truth and what's error. Because the devil will do his best to get in. And a lot of people have gone haywire going fasting and they come out with a vision that's haywire and cockeyed and crossways with the Bible and yet they become fanatical about it and they say, oh, but I saw it in this vision while I was fasting. It has to be from the Lord. Not necessarily. There are none of us above deception. We haven't got those glorified bodies yet, friend. And until we do, we need to check and cross-check things by the Scripture, by the things that do not change. And that doesn't mean you live in fear and, and panic and you say, well, we better not have anything to do with this. You know, that's what the Baptists and others have done for a long time. They've backed off from a lot of these things saying, well, you know, some of them went haywire, so we better just stay away from that altogether. That'd be like saying some people who get saved don't really follow through, so we better just junk the plan of salvation until we find out we can make sure that everybody that professes faith in Christ makes it, huh? Wouldn't that be foolish? 
Or they say, well, the Corinthians, you know, they got all the gifts messed up. Look what happened to them. Boy, I don't want that kind of mess in my church. Well, why don't they throw out the Lord's Supper while they're at it? They have that in the mess, too. But every one of those people that are so strong to throw out the gifts because of the Corinthians are observing the Lord's table. Tell you something else. I'm thankful for the Corinthian church mess. Had you ever thanked the Lord because Corinth got in such a mess? You ought to be thankful. I ought to be thankful. Do you realize what a, what a, what a vacancy there would be in our understanding and our, our teaching about the order of things and how the gifts operate, how the Lord's Supper should be, if the Corinthian church hadn't gotten in a mess and had to be straightened out? I tell you, God uses the bad things to His advantage. And no matter what, how big a mess the devil makes, if we'll commit it to the Lord and really trust the Lord, He'll turn it around and hit the devil over the head with it and use it as a way to protect other people from the same things. And your own mistakes. Don't you let the devil beat you over the head with those either. If you make a mistake, the only people who don't make mistakes are those who don't do anything. I've had people say, well, I would go into deliverance, but I'm afraid I'd make a mistake. Oh, my land. If you make a mistake and learn from it, you haven't lost. You've gained. And it'll rub your pride out, too. And God doesn't have any use for that anyway, so it's just as well he got it. The sooner it gets to race, the better. Of course, about the time you think it's all gone, you'll find out it'll rear up again in another spot. It is possible to transfer spirits. Would you turn with me to Numbers chapter 13, please? Numbers chapter 13. They sent out the spies into Canaan, the very familiar story. I'm sure all of you are aware of it. In Numbers chapter 13, down to verse 17, Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan, and said unto them, Get you up into this way southward, go up into the mountain, see the land, what it is, that the people that dwell therein, whether they be strong or weak, few or many, and the land, whether it's good or bad, city, what kind of cities they're in, whether in tents or strongholds, and so on and so on. He gives them the instructions. They go out, and then they come back with the report in verse 27. And they told him and said, We came into the land whither thou sentest us. It's true, it flows with milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it. And they carried some grapes in that weighed clusters between 25 and 45 pounds. It took two men to carry them. It was a fruitful land. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in that land. And their cities are walled and very great. More, we saw the children of Anak there, the giants. Those folks were the kind of people that grew eight and nine feet tall. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south. The Hittites, Jebusites, Amorites dwell in the mountains. The Canaanites dwell by the sea and the coast of Jordan. And Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. But the men that were with him said, We are not able to go against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report of the land where they had searched on the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof, all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. We saw the giants, the sons of Anak, to come, in, come of giants. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, so we were in their sight. Now, there's an interesting thing in the 13th verse of Numbers, that chapter, when they were uh, listing the names of the people who were sent out as spies. There was one man there in, in verse 13. His name was Sethar, son of Michael. It's a strange thing. Sethar means, his name means, to hide or to conceal. And if you go into uh, the numeric numerical values of Hebrew letters or something, it spells out 666. Isn't that a strange coincidence? And I think, I may be speculating, but I think that Sethar was one of the men who had a different spirit. You know, it doesn't take but one person in the midst of a group to throw it. The communists have boasted that if they could put one person in each city block of a town, they could control the entire town. And it's been proven over and over again that it doesn't take a majority to overthrow something. It takes a minority that's determined and dedicated. The majority report comes in. Notice how it came in. The first report was good. Yes, the land is there. It's exactly as it was pictured. It does flow with milk and honey. It's a fabulously rich land. Uh, yes, the fruit of it is unbelievable. But there are some real problems. And here it is. The people in the land are strong. They live in great walled cities. And they are giants. And when we looked at them, and we looked at ourselves, we became grasshoppers in our own sight. In other words, it's impossible. The majority report, 10 to 2, came in. Now, uh, notice what happened to the congregation as a result of this minority report, of this majority report coming in. It said, 
the congregation cried with one voice and wept all night long because all the promises of God had just been canceled out. Now you think about it. They wept all night. The whole congregation was swayed by a spirit because you're going to find out later that there was a different spirit in Caleb and Joshua. It was a spirit that did the work. And a spirit of discouragement and defeat had swept through the camp of Israel because of the majority report. We are so influenced by the majority, aren't we? If you don't believe it, look at the clothes we wear. Look at the, look at the fads and fashions that sweep. And, uh, young pe- and, you know, the people most affected by fads and fancies are in the teenage group. If you notice that in school, it becomes fashionable. Uh, for the kids to wear blue jeans that drag the ground and wear out. And they walk around with shredded rags around their shoes. When I was a young person that age growing up, I would have died if I'd had to go to school with ragged pants. You know, I mean, I couldn't, I couldn't conceive of that. But everybody was doing it. And I told you earlier, everybody's doing it. It's the oldest excuse in the world. Adam used it in the garden. Eve was everybody, and everybody was eating fruit. So he didn't want to miss out, so he joined. And God didn't accept that excuse then, and he never has since. And yet we are still swayed by the majority. There's something within us that doesn't want to be all by ourselves or in the little bunch. So when our church gets big, we think success. When God multiplies by dividing and adds by subtracting, then we get all panicky. We think the world has come to an end, when really it's just beginning. You have to, God has to clean out and root, root up and tear down before He can build. If the foundation is not solid, if the building is not sound, it must be ripped down to the foundation of Jesus Christ and then re-erected on sound principle. And I'll tell you, a lot of the works that have been built have been built as, well, some of them, I'm, uh, to me, it looks... Uh, let me say this. It looks to me as if some of these things are monuments to men's vanities Amen. rather than glorifying the Lord. And the Lord told me to do it as one of the most overused phrases I've ever heard. Amen. We ought to be very careful about using this. Are you sure the Lord told you? How did he do it? Are you sure? Some people, you know, get so close to the Lord, everything they say and do is of the Lord. They think. You know what? Everybody asks them, what the Lord? <laughs> We need to examine motivations. God is always concerned about motivations, why you do something, why you give something, why you go somewhere, more so than he is what you do. Did you know that? The the gift takes on the character of the giver. And if you give for reprehensible or, or irresponsible reasons, bad motivation, your gift is canceled out. Some people give to be recognized because you get to stand up if you give so much. Did you ever see a wave offering? Oh, Lord. That's wave it and put a a $5 bill in your hand. Now everybody wave. Can you imagine the Apostle Paul taking an offering like that? Hmm? I can't imagine him doing a lot of things. Can you? I don't even think he would raffle off a bicycle for the one that brought the most to church. You know? I just think that we need to... Ask the Lord to get us back to the simplicity that's in Christ. It's so easy to be swayed by the Spirit that's swaying through the group that we're in. The Holy Spirit is able to give us stability if we'll listen to Him. But the Holy Spirit is a gentleman and he He never pushes and shoves. He comes and moves by invitation. Now the devil's spirits work very brashly and strong and they'll do it. I don't care whether you like it or not, I'm going to do it. I heard somebody say a long time ago, many years ago, a very wise man of God, teacher I had, he said, men don't ever stand and preach on hell unless your heart is literally torn and broken because people are going there. He said, more harm has been done by men standing up and gleefully shouting, you're going to hell, and they were really glad of it. He said, it ought to be a heartbreaking thing. It ought to make you, you ought to preach on hell with tears in your heart and in your eyes. It's a horrible thing. That men are lost. We need to examine our motivations. The majority report came in, and it was carrying the day. Did you know the majority's been wrong nearly every time? I have a master's degree in history. 
Did you know in history the majority has been wrong over and over and over and over again? You can take it into the secular field. The majority has been wrong nearly all the time. Very seldom have they been right. And yet we still go along with the idea that the majority must be carrying it. No, we've got to find out what's right and stand for it if we're the only ones. Did you know that this word is true whether anybody believes it or not? Do you know that God doesn't need us to believe his word in order to verify him? You meet people every once in a while who, who seem to have the idea that isn't it wonderful that God has me on his side? I am such an asset to God. Baloney. God made the whole shooting match before you and I ever came on or any more than a thought in his mind. Hmm? He doesn't need any of us. We need him desperately. He can run the whole, whole thing if we never do another thing. But isn't it wonderful that he's chosen to involve us and to allow us to be a part of the tremendous moving of God? The marvelous thing of his grace is the fact that he would choose to involve us at all. A bunch of imperfect instruments. The majority report said, it is a great thing, it's too bad, we can't have it. In spite of the promises of God, we can't do it. <coughs> well, Joshua and Caleb, this was unbelief clothed in practicality. That's what it was. It made sense. Rationally, it was as sound as could be. Wall cities. How would you like to go in an army and fight an army of men eight and nine feet tall? How about you, Glenn? <laughs> but most of these people didn't have the heart of David. It took a while to get David on the scene. There weren't too many Davids there. My, my. The enemy didn't come as a roaring lion. He came sweet and reasonably. Well, now that would be wonderful, however. It's too bad. It's a lovely dream. But all the circumstances indicate no. The only thing it says yes is God's Word. And of course, everything else is against it. Isn't it awful the way we take the report? Now, the thing, the thing that makes this so crucial, you have to know that it is the Word of God. God had spoken clearly, unmistakably, definitely, positively. You will go into the land. You will possess it. It will be yours. All you need to do is obey me. But there was a spirit among the spies that infected the whole group, with the exception of two who had a different spirit, Joshua and Caleb. And that spirit of defeat, discouragement, and unbelief communicated itself to perhaps two and a half to five million people. That's pretty powerful poison. First it captured ten, and then it spread quickly throughout the multitude, so much so that they wept and cried all night. Now, everybody in the camp of Israel knew what the promises of God was. Otherwise, they wouldn't have been weeping over the fact that now we can't have it. They had been told by a sure word of God through Moses, this is what will happen. Not only that, but they had the background of miracle upon miracle upon miracle. They had the man of God at their head. He was a verified prophet again and again and again. He had told them the truth, nothing but the truth. He had led them unerringly. And they had seen miracles wrought. They had seen the Word of God confirmed at His hand again and again, all the way to Canaan. And then they get up there and, and a stinking spirit infiltrates and turns the whole group against what God has said. Well, you'll find Moses and Aaron in verse 5 of chapter 14 falling on their face before all the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel. They fall on their face. When a man of God has been given a sure word of God and leads his people up to the place where God wants them to move and the crucial decision comes and suddenly another spirit has infiltrated the group. And there's consternation among the people. And the majority begin to flake off and say, well, we can't do that. It's enough to make the man of God fall on. Where else is there to go but to the Lord when the enemy has come in and infiltrated? Now, thank God you have two men who came back who had another spirit. They had a spirit from the Lord. Now, notice what the minority report. They said, wait a minute. Everything hasn't been said. We have a report. The majority has given their report. We'll give the minority report. Here it is. Two to ten. Now notice. Verse six. Joshua, son of Nun, Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, 
were of them that searched out the land, they tore their clothes, and they spake unto all the company of the children of Israel, saying, The land which we pass through to searches is an exceedingly good land. It's better than we imagined. If the Lord delight in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land flowing with milk and honey. Only rebel not ye against the Lord, neither fear ye the people of the land, for they are but bread for us, and their defense is departed from them, and the Lord is with us, fear them not. So the congregation said, oh, well, that's nice. Well, then let's just do it. They did. They gathered up rocks, and they said, let's kill these troublemakers, these fanatics. We don't want to hear them. That's right. The devil will always move to kill to stop the voice of those who bring in the minority report favoring doing what God says. Hello, minority. Believe you me, when you go back into your places, tread softly. If you believe in deliverance as a part of a minister of the New Testament church, as taught in scriptures, you are a minority. And they will stone you. <laughs> And I want you to notice, now you have Moses who had given the command, then you have Joshua and Caleb giving this ringing report and saying, it's true, the people are great, but so what? Our assets are greater. The armies are big, but the armies of heaven are greater. We can do it. If we'll be faithful to the Lord, he'll t there's no problem. And this made the unbelieving host so angry they gathered up stones to stone them. And the only thing that stopped it was the glory of God fell. Notice it in the 10th verse. The glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle and everybody fell flat on their face. It was the intervention of God that saved Joshua and Caleb from getting killed for speaking the truth. I'll tell you what. If you're going to speak the truth, you better be sure you're on good ground because they may kill you. They've killed a lot of people. The devil has killed a lot of people for just telling the truth. Did you know that? <coughs> But on the other hand, you can count on God's intervention if you're standing on sure ground where God has led you. This shows you just one example of what a tremendous influence the infiltration of a wrong spirit can do in a whole crowd. It turned the whole thing. Now, you know, the majority carries weight. Evil gets the most publicity. If I tell you, uh, Preacher Jones over here preached a marvelous meeting and there were... 500 people saved in that tiny little church and community. And then I say, Brother Jones over here ran off with somebody's wife. Which report will get the widest circulation? Hmm? The majority report, though it may be wrong and anti-God, will have the greatest publicity behind it. Be careful. We've got to weigh and consider. We've got to seek the Lord. If we don't know the answer, we've got to get on our faces and search for the answer. Now, you know, it's easy to accept the majority report, too. One reason people are swayed by the majority report, for instance, Israel. If they accept the majority report, they don't have to do anything but weep and wail and say, well, God failed. If they accept the minority report, they've got to get themselves ready to fight giants. Which one do you think they're going to be with the laziness that's in the human heart? The slothfulness. The fearfulness. You don't think you've got any until you face the situation. And boy, it'll rear up right on its hind legs, saying, nah, ah, 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 ah. not now. Well, if you, it is encouraging because later on in Joshua 2.24, after God had gotten rid of the majority, they came and they sent out spies again. And a different report came back. And this time, General Joshua led them into the land. Did you know something? Or let me mention another thing about the majority. Before the flood, Noah and his family were the minority. After the flood, they were the majority. There wasn't anybody else left. <laughs> Did you know there's coming a day like that again? You may think that you're hemmed up and you're just you and maybe your little bunch are just the only ones practically, except for a few nuts scattered here, there, and yonder. But did you know there's coming a day when we're going to be the majority? God's going to wipe the enemies off the face of the earth. He's going to do it by spectacular power. The name of Jesus, the resurrection and glory of the Lord is going to accomplish things such as we've never dreamed possible. I don't even understand how he's going to do it all, but I sure am glad. I don't understand half of what I read in the Bible. But I believe that I'm on safe ground. 
I don't have anything to pick and quibble at with God's Word. I can say some of it I don't understand. I don't see how it fits. But I know this. I know God hasn't lied. I know He's not confused. I may be, but He's not. Did you know God's not confused? A lot of people act as if God's on the, on the dock. You know, you've got to tell me this and you've got to tell me. He doesn't have to do anything. I mean, He's on track. We need to get on track. Besides that, how do you know you could handle all this revelation you've been asking God for and getting all pouty with the Lord because He didn't come through? He didn't give me no revelation. Well, God knows you better than you know yourself. Maybe you can't handle it yet. What are you doing with what you got? Some people say, well, you know, if I had money, I'll tell you Lake Hamilton would be paid out of debt. Is that so? Well, it's not what you do with a million. If riches should be your lot, it's what you're doing at present with a dollar and a quarter you've got. And if you won't be honest and true with God with what He's already put in your hands, whatever made you think that He's going to entrust other things into your hands? I mean, if you cheat and steal from God with a little, you'd cheat and steal if He gave you a lot. You'd be in a whole lot more trouble. Isn't it a blessing? He didn't give you much. Huh? I mean, instead of being a little crook, you'd be a big one. You ought to be thanking the Lord. You ask the Lord to get that crookedness out of you, then He can entrust other things into your hand. I mean, if you got up and sang or preached or taught or, or testified or prayed and somebody bragged on it and said it was so wonderful, just blessed their heart, and you got kind of puffy with pride about it, aren't you glad that God doesn't use you anymore? Because if He used you a whole lot, you'd get puffed up. He'd have to throw you up there and, and let you go down a while. You know, punch you like a hot balloon full of hot air. We've got to do like He said with Moses. What is that in nine hand? Well, it's an old stick. What do you want with that? Well, I'll show you. I don't need anything but an old stick. And every time you get puffed up, remember, use the stick to confound the Pharaoh and all his magicians. Why use the... He used the rooster crowing. Convict Peter. Don't get all puffed up because you witnessed to somebody and they got under conviction. He did that with a rooster crowing. <laughs> Not only that, he used the donkey to talk, talk to Balaam. So God can use it. And, and Jesus even threatened the Pharisees one day. You remember that? He's riding in on the donkey. And they were jumping up and down, and the children were screaming and hollering and clapping their hands and uh, saying, here comes the son of David. Well, they were scandalized. They said, make those kids hush. Oh, what a horrible, oh, how disgraceful. Jesus said, are you sure you want them to hush? He said, friend, the son of God's coming in. Somebody's going to shout and praise the Lord because of it. And if I shut those up, the rocks will start clapping their hands and yelling. How would you like that? That scared the daylights out of them. You better let the young ones go ahead. The rocks are today. Yeah. The tape recorder is a ground up rock. Praise the Lord. Praising the Lord. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Back to this matter of spirits. There was a new spirit in Caleb. Check it out. There's another thing uh, in Numbers 11, 16 and 17. I want to just touch on it and I'll let you jot it down and, and meditate and mull over it. You know what meditation is, don't you? It's like a cow. She eats grass all over the place and she just swallows it. And then come along about noon, she'll find a nice shady tree or something. She'll lay down over there and then she goes, Boop, and she starts chewing. That's meditation. She's been feeding. Now then she's getting the good out of that food that when she's chewing her cud. You and I need to graze on the Word of God and then there are times when we need to get off and just chew the cud. Let God give us the nourishment and the deeper meanings out of these things. In Numbers 11, 16 and 17, it talks about the spirit of Moses coming on the elders. These spirits can be, man can be transferred, not only bad spirits, but good ones. It talks about the spirit of Moses being imparted to those elders. That's kind of a nice thought. That's better than the negative side, isn't it? Um, the seventy elders come, and God will put their spirit. He said, I'll take of the spirit which is upon thee, and I'll put it on them, the spirit of Moses. And they shall bear the burden of the people with thee, that thou bear not thyself alone. So it's possible to impart a good spirit to others. Now, most of you are aware of this, but you need to be aware that the enemy counterfeits this, and he imparts spirits also. Everything that the devil is doing... Uh, is a counterfeit, a cheap imitation of the real thing. But if you don't know much about the real thing, you can be fooled. And even if you know about the real thing, when you get into deep religious deception, it can be so close that you have to really go to the Word of God and find out. And you really have to lean on the Lord. 
The further you walk with God, the deeper your walk becomes with God, the more danger you're in. You become target number one. Now, that shouldn't frighten you. If that frightens you, then you're not ready to go this far yet. I mean, don't you want to live dangerously? You're just going to burn up daylight for nothing? Or would you rather, if you're going to die, would you rather die for something than nothing? You know, I mean, uh, after all, this world doesn't have much to offer anyway, does it? Except the opportunity to serve the Lord. Now, that's great. But the further you walk with the Lord, the more you're going to understand that things of this world don't satisfy. Not even almost. So the Spirit of Moses was going to be imparted to them. Now, this Spirit, this strange thing about this, they, they had submission to a Spirit here that brought them into one mind, one accord, one Spirit, and their submission and acceptance of authority was wholly voluntary. They worked for the whole and not for the group. They didn't go off kingdom building by themselves. They were working for the whole group of the welfare of the whole nation. You check that out. And they supported Moses as long as he lived. They were backing him up. There's one other area I want us to hit. I'm just trying to stimulate your curiosity a little bit about some of these things. Because if you'll take your concordance and start running references, you're going to find a lot more about these spirits than what I'm talking about. In 2 Kings 6.13, there's an interesting story. Elisha had been marked out for death. And they, the enemy sent an army... Verse 14, he sent to their horses, chariots, great hosts. They came by night, circled the city. The servant of the man of God was risen early, gone forth. Behold, a host compassed, circled the city, both with horses and chariots. And his servant said unto him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? He said, Fear not, they that be with us are more than they that are with them. Now, you remember the story. They got up early in the morning. This servant boy was a fine young fellow. I mean, he wouldn't have stayed with Elisha if he was a... A drag. He had to be somebody that was really interested in the things of the Lord. He gets up early in the morning. He looks out through the early dawn, just lights just breaking, and he sees they're circled about with an enemy army. It scares the daylights out of them. The jig is up. They've come for Elisha. And they're just waiting for daylight to break so they'll be sure he doesn't slip through. And they're going to close in. He wakes up the prophet and says, Oh, come and look. They're all around us. So Elisha looks up. Oh, mm -hmm. okay, no problem. The poor kid is all shook up. He's disturbed. And suddenly Elisha realizes that he doesn't see what Elisha sees. He's only seen the enemy. He has not seen the armies of God. Now notice what he does. He prays and says, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw... Behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire around Elisha. If we could see the armies of God, sometimes it would encourage us. Now, Elisha could see into the spirit world. This is not the first time he saw into the spirit world. You remember when he followed after Elijah, and Elijah kept trying to shake him loose? Elijah would say, why don't you go home? Nope, believe I'll just go with you. Well, I'm going over so-and-so. You sure you don't want us to go home? Nope, I'll go along with you. And he trailed along with the mighty prophet. And he stopped and Elijah said, Why aren't you going home now? I've got to go over here. All right, I'll go with you. And they went on. You remember how they went. And the other prophets, there were other prophets of the Lord there. And they watched Elijah go, but it was Elisha that was right on his coattail. Wouldn't let him out of his sight. See, Elisha had decided he was going to have that power that was on Elijah. Finally, Elijah said, What do you want? Now, you see that fellow grin and say, I thought you'd never ask? He said, I want a double portion of the Spirit that's on you. And I just said, well, you've asked a hard thing, but if you see me leave, you can have it. Now, I think the devil really gave Elisha a run for his money. I think he tried every way to shake him loose. Even the prophet Elijah seemed to be trying to discourage him. But you know, I found out something. If you can discourage somebody from following the will of God, they're not really that committed. Amen. I'm not saying you should do it. Young fellows in our church come to me and say, I believe the Lord's calling me to preach. And yet I don't recall ever preaching a sermon and saying, Oh, please come and lay your life on the altar and go preach the Word of God, young men. It's the highest calling you can have. You can get a, you can get a church full of preachers that way. So called. But you don't have to do that if you just teach them to walk with the Lord and then let God do the calling. And they come to me, I say, Well, can't you do anything else and be happy? They look at me like I hit them, you know. They thought I'd be all excited because the Lord's called them to preach. 
And they think, they think about it and say, well, I don't think so. I say, well, you go pray about it. If you can do anything else and serve the Lord, then, then you should do it. And I've had one after the other come back to me. I've got about 12, 15 of them hanging around there somewhere. And they say, Brother Worley, I just don't believe that I'll ever be happy unless I'm ministering. <laughs> Praise the Lord. That's the kind you can't shake loose. Why, you mean if I, if I can shake them loose, don't you think the devil can do a better job? If they can get discouraged because I don't jump up and down and clap my hands about it. Now, not one of them has surprised me. The Lord has told me ahead of time about different ones that I would never in this world tell one of them they're called to preach. Even if I know it. Because some of them are called, but they won't, they'll, never, they'll never feel that calling. Not because God didn't call them, but because they just they missed the way. You've got to choose to walk with God. He's not going to force you. And I'll tell you one thing, though, if you really, if he's really got a string on you, there's no way. Well, Elisha followed along with the prophet of fire. And you remember the story, of course. The chariots of fire came, picked him up, and he went up in a whirlwind, a tornado. And the mantle fluttered down and fell at Elisha's feet. That must have been kind of a traumatic shock, you know? Had you ever thought about it? I mean, had you ever prayed for anything and watched for anything and, and then, then when it happened, it just threw you into almost a state of shock? Elijah's gone. When Elijah was here, great things could happen. And he's walking along with that mantle in his hand. He walks back to the river. I wonder, Elijah's gone. Will God ever do it again? The mighty man whom the enemy could not stop is gone. Can, can God do it again? He rolls that mantle up. He looks at that river. Where's the Lord God of Elijah? What? The Lord said, I'm not here. And the waters just began to roll. And I'll tell you, he was stepping along when he went across. Praise God. He's still in business. You know, there's always when a leader is taken that has been a mighty blessing to many people, there's always kind of a sag, you know. It's kind of like when an airplane takes off. And when they pull the, when they pull the wheels up, the plane mushes a little bit. But then it goes, Ugh. And when God takes the leader, it's usually because he's fixing to go higher. Elisha had the double portion of Elijah on him. We need the spirit of Elijah to come upon people today. The spirit of Elijah is the only remedy for Jezebel. Jezebel and Ahab will never be defeated except by men and women motivated and empowered by the spirit of Elijah. Remember this. Elijah was tested physically. He could not be seduced into immorality and licentiousness. The first move of Jezebel is sexual immorality, money, pleasure, power. Elijah brushed those things aside. He could not be seduced. He could not be seduced spiritually. His eyes were on the Lord. Watch out for Jezebel. This is the way it works. Seduction, spiritually and physically. Either way, either trail, you're crippled. But the spirit of Elijah is the one thing that Jezebel and Ahab both fear. When we first came to understand a little bit about the loosing of the spirits of God, and still don't know much about it, but I, I know that it's the key to winning the battle, loosing those armies of heaven. Right after that happened, I was in a meeting in Nevada, I think it was, and a young man came to me and he laid his head on my shoulder and began to weep and said, and he couldn't talk. And I, I asked him what he wanted and he couldn't tell me. He'd look at me and then he'd just weep and sob and sob and sob. He'd been through some heavy deliverance and I knew that his life had been really changed. And he just laid his head on my shoulder and he wet my coat just weeping. And I asked the Lord, I said, what does this young man want? And the Lord said, he'll tell you in a minute. And finally he sobbed out. He said, I want the kind of love that's flowing through you. <clears throat> well, that cracked me up. I said, are you sure, son? There's a price tag on agape love. He said, I don't care. That's what I want. I said, all right. And I just laid hands on him. And before I was finished, the Holy Spirit had flowed through me like Niagara Falls. And that boy was, he was trembling like a leaf. And then he just went, whoo, he clunked. And when he came up, he was weeping, more laughing, crying. And I said, come here, son, there's one more thing the Lord wants for you. 
I laid hands on him and I said, I loose on this young man the spirit of Elijah. And when I did, his body jerked. And he said, what was that? I said, that, my son, was the spirit of Elijah. You're getting ready to tangle with Jezebel somewhere down the trail. There's no reason for God to loose that kind of thing unless there's going to be a confrontation. I think it'll be interesting to find out. It is possible to transfer spirits, keep your guard up against the wrong kind, and open your heart up to the spirits of God. Amen. Amen. I hope this will at least tickle your brains enough to go, Oh, I was going to tell you that Elisha saw into the spirit world the day that Elisha was taken. He saw those horses. Did you know that he didn't want them to go look for the body? Remember that? The other prophet said, let's go hunt for his body. Elisha said, no. They said, let's go look for the body. He said, no. He knew it wasn't necessary. They'd never find it. He knew where Elisha went. They just saw him go up in a tornado. Elisha saw the horses and chariots of the Lord. But finally, he said, well, go and look. You're not going to be satisfied until you go look. Go ahead and look. When they came back, they said, we couldn't find him. He said, didn't I tell you not to go? There's sometimes when you have to let people go ahead and do what they want to or else they'll think there's something wrong with you. Let them find out for themselves there's nobody there. I believe that God is moving in these days, I think in the days that lie immediately ahead of us. There's going to be an opening of the spirit world. And I believe that many people, lost and saved, are going to have their spiritual eyes open. I think the Satan's coming out of the thicket. And I think we're going to see manifestations, demonic manifestations stalking down the street. They're going to be mind-boggling. It's going to drive some people out of their minds. I don't know how far down the line, but the Lord has been impressing me about this, that there's coming a day, and it's not too far off, when the devil is going to be in such power, he's going to sweep with such tidal waves of evil, supernatural power, he's going to come out in the open. He's already out in the open more than he's ever been. In America, the occult revolution and revival has just swept the land. And evil is coming out. The old lion is out of the thickets. And he's going to come out and you're going to be able to see things you won't want to see. You better get your mind covered by blood. You better get in practice. I'll guarantee you, if you ever run smack into a demon, it'll scare the daylights out of you. You'll have to stop and get under the blood and re- uh, remind the Lord and yourself and everybody else in concerned here that you're under the blood. Then, I mean, you'll come back to balance. The first few times it happens, it's a very unsettling experience. I've had some people walk up where we were doing deliverance and some demon turn with those eyes blazing and say, I hate your guts. I'm going to kill you. And that person would jump like they were shot the first time they'd ever got hit. I said, don't be afraid. Rebuke him in Jesus' name. One of the, one of the things that I enjoy about a mass deliverance service is when you come through and you, you uh, renounce all the things that are evil and everything, and you, and you come through and you get the people to close the door to Satan. You, you have them confessing things to the Lord. And then you come, Satan, I rebuke you in Jesus' name. And it's so strange. You can listen to the tapes and the voice is always right. Satan, I rebuke you in Jesus' name. By that time, the people are angry with the devil because they've been deceived, they've been misled, and they're moving around they've got their fighting clothes on. <laughs> now, if we can get people get their fighting clothes on, get mad at the right enemy, what a blessing it'll be. Amen? And you can impart the spirit of the spirits of God to other people, the spirit that's in you. Look at churches that have been torn up by spirits of dissension. One spirit gets in it and ding, 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 ding. Next thing you know, the whole congregation is vibrating. Hmm? The spirits, we must learn how to bind evil spirits, but we must also loose the opposite spirits of God. You don't want to just leave a vacuum because the devil will move in there. Uh, you say, oh, well, I just pray the Holy Spirit will fill the place. I think you'll be better off if that's fine, but I believe you'll be better off if you'll be specific and ask the Lord to send specific angelic spirits to come in there. Where there's hate, loose love. Where there's fear, loose love. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but He has given us a spirit of love, power, and sound mind. That's the antidote to fear. Now, those agape love will knock the daylights out of fear. Agape love will drive hate right up the wall. And the spirit of adoption will drive rebellion crazy and rejection. We need to learn to use the weapons of our warfare. We're just babies, such babies. Every time I run across a demon that we can't seem to dislike, I get angry. Not with the person, not with the Lord. I get angry with myself. Why are you so stupid? The demons are right. You're dumb. You know practically nothing. Let's get on the stick. Let's get with the Lord. Let's learn what he wants us to learn. We need to walk in power. You know the reason we're not? Because he can't trust power yet. People say, oh, fill me with your power, Lord. Have you got any ground wire? 
Are you grounded? You, did you ever see one of these guys at the sideshow that lets so many thousands of volts go through his body, you know, and he has a little wand and a copper ball and the, and the lightning dances out of his fingers and out of a little wand all into this ball and everything. And you wonder, how in the world can all that power pass through his body and he's not even hurt? I can't even stick my finger in a socket without dancing a jig. You know, and hear all these great powers and lightning coming out of his fingers and everything else, you know? You know how I can do it? Because that platform he's standing on is insulated. If one little bell wire was running to the ground, that stuff would burn him to a crisp. Here we are. Oh, fill me with your power. God says, oh, cut your ground wires. If I ran that much power through, you'd burn to a crisp. You're grounded to the things of this world. Love not the world, either the things that are in the world, or the love of the Father and the love of the world don't mix. The ground wires that we have, we love these things. Brother Frank talked about them. You know, that these little things that we cling and they, they become idols to us. We love them better than we love the Lord. Oh, these are so precious, so sweet, so useless. Have you ever stopped to think about so many things in eternity that are going to mean absolutely nothing? We live as if this is all there is. The devil deceives us into doing this. And we're so stupid, we get deceived again and again. Just when we think we've learned, we have to relearn. No wonder God can't entrust great power. You see these high lines running across the, in these great big towers, carrying power from place to place. You know those big old insulators on there? Before a power line can carry tremendous voltage, it must be isolated from all the other wires. I'm so lonesome. Isolation is insulation. You said, I want to be filled with power, so God is separating you from everybody. I don't want to be by myself. I feel like I'm by myself when I'm in a crowd. Isolation is insulation. God's preparing you to carry power. That's what you asked for. Why are you whining? Why am I complaining? And God said, I wish you'd look at that crybaby. There he is again. He just got through fasting a week and saying, Oh, fill me with power. Now he's weeping and crying because I've cut him off from some things that were distracting and keeping him from doing what he has to be doing. You say, Oh, I've got so much business to do. If I didn't have so much business, to do, I could just do so much more for the Lord. The Lord looks down and said, Well, bless his heart. He does have an awful lot to do. <laughs> well, angels, let's go down there. Uh, loose the tormentors there. Let's get, let's get rid of some of that stuff. It really won't count in eternity anyway. Just take some of that away. Next thing you know, oh, all my stuff is gone. I'm ruined. No, no, you have time now. You have nothing else to do. Oh, I serve the Lord, but I just have to work. You know, I've been working ten hours a day and, and all this and that and the other. And I, oh, I wish I had time to serve God. If I had time, I'd serve you, but I, you know how it is. Lord said, bless your heart. <laughs> Lay off. Fade shock. You didn't have time to pray, didn't have time to read the Bible. God gives you plenty. Mm-hmm. You get to run and sow. Sometimes God lets you lay and look at the look at the ceiling. Be careful what you ask for. <laughs> I'm talking about all of us. We've got to find out. We we all want to know why doesn't the power fall? Why doesn't the power come? God wants our ground wires cut. We've got ourselves involved in masses of all kinds of important things that don't amount to a hill of beans. Every one of us is guilty. You'll never... God made it His full-time business to save the souls of men and women, and He can't do an awful lot with our spare time. If you try to serve God in your spare time, the devil will see that you don't have any. That's right. You'll be so busy with so many good projects. Now, because you're religiously oriented, the devil says, oh, don't, don't wave those gross things around, those, those fanatics. You know, they'd never pick up on that. They'd say, oh, forget it. That's evil. I can tell that's from the devil. No way. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. I'm free from that kind of stuff. But he said, come at them with sweet religious activities and things that are good and sweet and lovely but are just as carnal as a billy goat. <laughs> Sometimes I, 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 get, I get so annoyed. I get annoyed myself more than I do somebody else. When I sit down and think of all the things, 
And I think, what's this going to have to do? What difference will this make in 50 years? And here I've been upset all day about it. Now, that's not very religious, but, you know, and I wouldn't say it out loud. Or now, you won't tell anybody, will you? i got a couple of members here, and I'll kill them if they tell anybody. <laughs> <laughs> now, they know better than that because we're always, at our place, we, we, don't, we don't go much for sham. We might as well admit it. We're all rotten material, and God's just rebuilding the whole structure. Amen. Our church is full of the lame, the halt, and the blind. The only difference between us and the other churches, we admit it. And we just thank God that He's, he's doing a, a reconstruction on all of us. But seriously, reevaluate your life and ask, ask God, how is it going to be in eternity? What difference is it going to make in eternity if you get this or that or the other project done? What's most important? In eternity, what will it matter whether you did this, that, or the other thing? You say, well, you sound like a raving fanatic. No, I'm not. I wish I was, but you know, I'm working on it. We all need to move further than we are. There's none of us has anything to brag about. Did you know that? Had you ever thought about how God got shortchanged when he saved you and me? What did he get? What did he get when he saved you? He got ripped off, somebody said. That's right. If God was in business trying to get some, a good return on his investment, he sure got ripped off. I cried, I've gone too far. He said, my blood's gone farther. I cried, the stain's too deep. He said, my blood's gone deeper. I cried, I've done too much. He said, my blood's done more. Praise God, praise God for His cleansing blood. Where would I be if it had not been for Jesus? Where would I be if it had not been for Him? I was the toy of the Maker of sin. I'm glad Christ changed all that might have been. I cried, I've gone too far. times if you're not familiar with it, and I want you to let the words sink into your heart. I cried, I've gone too far. He said, my blood's gone farther. All right? I cried, I've gone too far. He said, my blood's gone farther. I cried, the thing to be. He said, my blood's gone deeper. people here who live a great deal of their life under the spirit of condemnation 
because of your past life and your past failures and the mess that your life was before you came to the Lord, and even because of terrible mistakes and and, uh, flippings and slidings you've made since you've known the Lord, the devil has loaded you up with spirits of condemnation and guilt and shame. And he keeps saying to you, you, you can't serve the Lord. Who are you to do anything for anybody? And the Lord reminded me that Jesus spoke of a woman who was able to love much because she had been forgiven much. And you can turn that disadvantage of a shattered life that's behind you into an advantage if you will let the love of Jesus just flow through you and that agape love of Jesus flow out through you. You can become a living wellspring of water to refresh the lives of others if you genuinely turn from it. And by the way, you say, oh, but my life is so broken and so shattered. Praise the Lord. Don't you know that a broken vessel can't hold anything? I told you one camp meeting here about the alabaster box. Ask God to break your alabaster box. When you break the alabaster box, it's totally useless for anything else. And everything in it will pour out. And after that, anything you pour into that alabaster box, because it's cracked and broken, will pour out. If Jesus pours love into you, you can't hold it. You just got to let it go. If the power of the Holy Spirit comes in, you can't hold it. It just pours out. Isn't that what we need? Broken vessels. These old whole vessels that are all spotted up and full of bacteria, specks and spots, it's much better for it to be broken and to be cleansed by that continual flowing of the love of Jesus. And people, somebody has to care. Somebody has to care because people are bound. I thank God for Glenn and Irma who care enough to sell out to the bare walls and move here on a vision that God gave them. Because they believe that God's people have to be free. I'm sure they're not the only people. I thank God for any of that I don't even know about. But I know about these people. And I don't know about you, but... (coughs) I don't see how we can not care when people are so bound, when the church is floundering in chains and bondage and wrong spirits are just deceiving. I don't see how we can hold back just because we don't want people to think badly of us. Jesus made himself of no reputation. If you don't give your life to Jesus, what are you going to do with it? There's some of you who've come here, and many of you have spoken to me and said, I believe God's moving me into this ministry. I wouldn't be off the fire. God is restored. The only thing that's going to get the church on its feet in time to meet the enemy is deliverance. I don't care what they say. We've got to get the people alerted and awake. We've got to get the church cleaned up. She'll never be able to fight. She's full of disease. Read the first chapter of Isaiah and you'll see the picture of the church today. She's full of running sores from head to toe. She's a mess. She's sick. She's helpless. She, she has no concept of spiritual warfare. I'm talking about the general outreach. But thank God he's, he's quickening parts of the body. And he's opening the door. And you start with yourself. And then you reach out to others. And you'll never do it unless you love them. It costs too much. It's too hard. The hours are too long. The toll is too great. And the only way you and I will ever be able to do it is if we love Jesus better than we love our own comforts, better than we love our own things. To leave everything and go to Jesus. Deliverance will revolutionize your life if you move into it. Amen. It will undergird and strengthen everything God's already doing and it will lead you into areas you never dreamed possible. And I would encourage you to pray and to give yourself to the Lord and ask Him to open doors for you. And you won't have to hunt the people. They'll hunt you up. Matter of fact, you'll wish they didn't know where you live sometimes. My heart breaks when I see the people in bondage. When I realize my own ignorance and ineffectiveness and failure to follow the Lord perfectly and to, to be as good a vessel as I ought to be. I feel ashamed before the Lord with all the power and all the knowledge that He's made available and how little we're really applying. And It's a shame. It's a disgrace, people. We ought to be ashamed of ourselves that we've availed ourselves of so little. The demons are telling the truth. They looked at me, one of them, and said, Worley, if you and your stupid bunch had any notion of how much power is in the name that you're using, how much power is in that blankety blank blood, we wouldn't have a chance against you. I said, thank you, demon. That's encouraging. That's an encouraging word from the other side, friends. 
The demons know how much power we have available. We haven't learned to use it. We're still using pop guns. And they're drawing up their heavy artillery against us. We've got to learn how to get the tanks operating. We've got to get the battleships in operation where we can throw a broadside into the enemy and knock the daylights out of him. We've got him outgunned. We've got to learn how to bomb him with atomic bombs, some power from on high. We've got lots to learn. Let's don't be so stupid as to think, oh, I've got it all now. I know everything. Don't try to tell me anything. Baloney. Anybody that's doing deliverance, you can learn something from. I'll tell you, get on their coattail and find out and listen and try to find out what they know. Because God has shown them something He hasn't shown you. I've never met a deliverance person yet that I didn't learn something from. Sometimes it's positive, sometimes it's negative. Sometimes they'd gone off the track and gotten off into counseling. I thought, oh, Lord, deliver me from that. Counseling is important as a supplement to deliverance. But the trouble is, people get into counseling and forget all about deliverance. Most people didn't have their ears counseled off before they ever get to you. Counseling would have helped. Everybody been perfect by now. You've got preachers doing it, psychiatrists doing it, psychologists doing it, the uh, social services are doing it. Everybody's counseling and nobody's getting free. We need to move into the battle. I don't know about you, but I, I just... Whatever years I've got left, I want to throw them in the battle for the Lord. Let me tell you something, friends. If you hear that when Worley was knocked down in the battle, I'll guarantee you one thing. It won't be because he ran the white flag up. If I go down, it'll be going down fighting. Now, I'm not saying I'm going down. I'm not going to open myself to the enemy. I'll fight him. But there are going to be some of us that are going to be killed in the struggle. Maybe it'll convince some of you that it's real. But I'll guarantee you, for every warrior that goes down flying the colors high, God will raise up an army of a hundred to replace them. We're moving into a place, friends, where they're going to be martyrs for the sake of Jesus. I don't know how long it's going to be, but I know we're coming into that time. And that's all right. What's so bad about that? You want to live a dull old empty life? It'd be better to live a short excitement than go out and burst the glory, wouldn't it? I mean, that's what God wants. If He wants you to live a long one, fine. Praise the Lord. John lived a long one. Some of the apostles lived a very short one. Paul ended his in a chopping block. Stephen ended his with crushed, life crushed out of him, praising God, saying, I see Jesus. And he threw the gig into Paul. As he was leaving, he put a glory hook into Paul. I'd like to run him nuts. Jesus spoke to him and said, uh, it's hard for you to kick against that spur in your side, isn't it? My servant Stephen did that. <laughs> And when old Saul said, Lord, what would you have me to do? I'm telling you, Stephen had a glory fit all over heaven. He did. He shouted all over the golden street. He ran up and down. Look, look, look. And then Jesus said, you don't know anything, son. Look what he's going to do. And then Stephen couldn't be handled. He went wild, sure enough. His life did more by snagging Paul than he probably would have done if he'd stayed on the earth a hundred years. We got this Bible still. Every time somebody comes down the Roman road and gets saved, Stephen and Paul have a glory fed up in heaven. That's right. Stephen's drawing residuals on that too, you know. You help somebody to get on the way with the Lord. When we get to heaven, it's going to be breathtaking what, what God has done for the little that we've given. Oh, let's give ourselves to the Lord, people. God's raising up young men all across the country and young women who will fear nothing except the displeasure of God, who will go even to the death to serve the Lord. He's getting that army ready, friends. He's got an army. It's marching through the land. It's a little bitty ragtag bunch right now. But she's getting stronger. And it's not going to take everybody doing it, friends. It took one Elijah to absolutely demolish everything that Jezebel and her <coughs> priest had been able to do in years. <laughs> I like to think about that. Just a few Elijahs can destroy and demolish what it's taken the devil years to build. A demon looked at me one time after we'd been working for about three hours on a young a man who'd come in from up in Minnesota. And he looked at me and he was weeping and wailing. And he said, Worley, are you just going to get every single one? I said, I hope so. He said, well... I built this up for 30 years and you've just ruined everything. I said, thank God. We need to move in and ruin everything the devil has done. Let's destroy the works of the devil. Let's demolish the host of hell. Let's let them know the church is on the earth. Let's move in on them. The order of the day is attack. 
Attack. Attack. Praise the Lord. There are plenty of people in the ranks to come behind and minister healing and to minister other needful things. But there are not many on the battlefront. Let's feed them plenty to do. Amen? Every person in the body of Christ is not called into the same area. But those of us who believe that deliverance is so critical, we can give them plenty to do. Let's mop up the enemy and shoot the people back to be ministered to and to be grown up into the full stature of the Lord. And you know something? Even those who are in valid ministries now will be so enriched and deepened by deliverance themselves. It's incredible. Their ministries will be deepened and enriched. We just must get the message out. We've got to do it in love and humility. They'll never take it if we come proud and argue, say, you got demons. Well, you wouldn't appreciate that either, would you? We've got to ask the Lord to give us the wisdom, the understanding to deal in love and tenderness. And if our hearts are broken, they'll listen. Not all of them, but enough of them to turn the tide. Amen? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Lord. I wonder if we could sing, I'm free. Could we sing that? Is that all right, Brother Glenn? <laughs> you remember that one, by the way? You know what's on I'm free. Though the host of hell. Oh, yeah. Though the host of hell prevail, and the demons come past me apart, and they tell me that God is against me, that he will not help me out. God in heaven will answer and save me, and the armies of heaven will battle, while the angels of darkness shall flee at the light of his majesty. Oh, the Lord. kind of the theme song of the whole book. Um, We're moving into the last stages, preparing for the final crash of everything. And I believe that that although it's going to be the crash and the demolishing and destruction of the whole world system as we know it, it's going to be the church's most glorious hour. So God is preparing a people who are going to be different. And so... We don't approach this with fear. It's with joy and expectation because the greatest things that have ever been are going to be on the face of God's earth. Our church is being ready like a fortress. Uh, started praying for us to have a new building, and God has given us that new building. It's, it's tremendous. You could put the whole old building we had inside the auditorium alone. And we paid a quarter of a million dollars for the building. And when we moved in it three months ago, we owed a crushing debt of $33,000. And uh, in a month and a half, I believe it was, we owed $23,000. And as of today, we owe $17,000.
and we haven't taken a special offering yet. We're going to get around to that one of these days. Um, <laughs> and we're preparing. Uh, it has a uh, large there's rooms all over the place. The first shipment of survival food came in. Uh, over 800 cases of food our people had ordered from southern Indiana came in and our people are getting ready for the siege and uh, prophecies are coming through the church regularly warning the people to get ready that uh, the devil is going to make his move but God's going to move his people and we're planning we're in a bad location from one standpoint because we're in the big city which is the worst place to be when this crash comes. But somebody's got to be there to hold the torch high, and we don't plan to flee. Not only we may have to run for a little while, but we'll be back. But at any rate, we're preparing the church for a refuge, and we're already uh, the uh, men are cutting out plywood boards that are going to board up the basement windows so we can block them from inside, so they can't be forced from inside. The, the building is big enough to house our whole church if need be in an emergency. And um, we're getting ready. And uh, we believe that somebody ought to be there to pick up the pieces and tell people that Jesus loves them and give them the answer after whatever happens. Yeah. Some of us may die in the struggle, but that's all right. Yeah. And if you wonder what I'm talking about, read Demolishing the Host of Hell. It'll give you a little better uh, preview of what it's all about. You better get informed. There's no excuse for not being informed. Uh, Sunday morning a prophecy came through and it was a very solemn thing warning the people that God gives warning to his people like a trumpet and those who do not heed the trumpet but just say well God will take care of me anyway are going to be smitten by the enemy and he said you better get ready you have been warned that it's coming and so get ready and so we believe that like Joseph was warned like Noah was warned we're being warned to get ready